Happy Mills, the single most important animal welfare issue of today. This complex industry is highly misunderstood by the public and lawmakers alike. When people hear puppy mills are bad, they assume the core and humane issue relates to the welfare of the actual puppies, when in fact the horror exists behind closed doors with the breeding dogs, the mothers and fathers of those puppies. The dog breeding industry is very complex. There are small home breeders who breed and sell puppies as a hobby. These dogs are typically well cared for, considered part of the family, and live a normal life. Reputable and hobby breeders hold themselves to high welfare standards voluntarily. They find puppy mills abhorrent. On the other end of the spectrum exists a horror hidden from the public eye in the facilities who house dozens or even hundreds of breeding dogs. There are thousands of these facilities nationwide, many of which are licensed by the United States Department of Agriculture, better known as the USDA. The conditions inside the bounds of the property or inside the facilities where the breeding dogs live must meet mere survival standards. According to the USDA, this means breeding dogs must be provided with food only once a day. Water is to be given at minimum twice daily for one hour each time. Cages can have wire bottoms, allowing urine and feces to fall through so cages do not have to be cleaned on a regular basis. Wire floors are incredibly inhumane and lead to multiple medical issues over time. Cages are often stacked one on top of the other, indoors and outdoors, or suspended from ceilings like bird cages. Cage size requirements only state a dog must have a minimum of six inches headroom in the enclosure, making it nearly impossible for larger dogs to even turn around. Another regulation states that if the temperature drops below 50 degrees, the dogs must be provided with bedding, although a solid board on a wire floor constitutes bedding according to the law. The USDA even acknowledges in its regulations that confinement to an enclosure limits a dog's ability to make adjustments to temperature and weather, yet they still require minimal standards of comfort for these animals. Dogs housed individually are to be given the opportunity for exercise regularly, an ambiguous term defined by the facility owner themselves. Dogs housed in groups have no exercise requirements at all. Female dogs are bred at every heat cycle and males are used as studs until they no longer turn a profit. Unlike the puppies who are taken from these facilities to be sold, breeding dogs, the mothers and fathers of those puppies, live in these inhumane conditions 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, year after year. They live like this until they are no longer breedable and producing a profit for the facility owner at which time they are discarded, sometimes via very inhumane means. When adult breeding dogs are rescued, rather than disposed of, they almost always have severe medical issues and social anxiety. For most people, the realities of what is happening inside puppy mills is inconceivable. Who would allow an eight-year-old, five-pound, pregnant chihuahua to sit in a tiny wire cage with no bedding in 55-degree temperatures all day, every day, day after day, year after year? If we did that to our own rescue chihuahuas, we'd be investigated for animal abuse and likely face criminal charges. So what makes puppy mills different? Large-scale breeding facilities can hide behind being licensed without the public knowing companion animals are actually being regulated like livestock. While the breeding dogs remain in these facilities for life, remember, the puppies are being born and then sold on a wholesale market at an alarming rate. A facility of even 50 breeding dogs can produce nearly 1,000 puppies each year, and a facility of 200 produces as many as 4,000 puppies annually. These puppy mills have a direct pipeline to pet stores and online sellers, and the sale of puppies is not restricted across state lines. Pet stores in Colorado can buy puppies from across the country, and pet stores in other states can purchase puppies from Colorado breeding facilities. The pet stores obtain the puppies directly at a wholesale price, 
then inflate that amount to turn a profit. Puppies are regularly sold for several thousand dollars each. Due to the inhumane and unsanitary conditions inside puppy mills, it is not uncommon for puppies to be sick or have genetic issues. Unfortunately, it is the unsuspecting consumers who purchase these puppies from pet stores or online dealers who are perpetuating the inhumane treatment that is taking place in these puppy mills. The consumer demand for the puppies keep the mills in production. Private advocacy and awareness organizations have been tackling this issue for years with little result. And lawmakers are often reluctant to address the issue, both because they don't fully understand it and because they don't want to infringe on private business. But at some point, the abuse must move front and center. In cities and states where laws have been enacted, many pet stores have successfully shifted to an adoption rescue model, selling pet supplies and hosting adoption events with local rescues. Other stores have begun to voluntarily do this, but it's not enough. The adoption rescue model is a win-win. It helps to interrupt the puppy mill to pet store pipeline while finding homes for dogs and shelters, consequently reducing euthanasia rates of rescue animals. In Colorado alone, over 10,000 dogs and cats are euthanized in shelters each year. Meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of dogs continue to live in inhumane conditions inside puppy mills and their puppies continue to be bought and sold, perpetuating the cycle. Lawmakers and citizens can continue to turn a blind eye to this disturbing industry or they can take the lead. The time to take action is now.